For those of you who don't know me, my name's Luke, um, and I'm going to be speaking this morning um, on the subject of confession. So if you are, if you've been away for a while or maybe you've missed a couple of weeks, we've been going through a discipleship series and we've had um, a few themes before this. So the first was the call um, and that was all about follow me. That was Pastor Derek, and he spoke about Jesus revealing his, himself through his character, his words, his, his actions, and his written word. We had the cost that was wonderfully articulated to us. Amen. By the biggest amen in the room. Um, by Phil Harrison. He spoke that following Jesus comes with opposition, correction, separation, sacrifice, but with great reward. If you missed any of these, this is a summary. You can catch up. These are all online. Um, Rachel, is Rachel in? She's in Giants. Oh. Showing compassion. She spoke on compassion. Yes, yeah, seamless. And she spoke about having compassionate eyes, hands, feet, and hearts. And then Mark Ritchie came, told us loads of jokes, <laughs> was hilarious, and told us to go and tell the world about Jesus. And if you missed that, you should really listen to that. You should listen to any of those. But this morning, I've been tasked with talking about the confession of discipleship. Um, so, firstly, I think when we think of the word confession, often there's maybe, not everyone, but maybe there's a little bit worldview that confession is something that is done within the Catholic Church in a, in a confession booth. And you go and confess your sins to a priest. And when you've confessed your sins to a priest, those sins are gone. Okay, that's a little bit of a world view that's maybe been um, fed by this view from the Catholic Church. However, the biblical view of confession in that sense is not confession to a priest. You see, in the Old Testament, <coughs> there were priests, <coughs> excuse me, there were priests who acted as a mediator between God and man. Okay, so this is where this thought comes from, that a man sits as a mediator between us and God, and Jesus came as the final mediatory priest, the great high priest, the Bible tells us. So now we no longer confess our sins to a priest, we confess our sins to God directly through our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. That is something the Bible talks about and tells us about. In fact, the Bible calls us a royal priesthood. It talks about us all being priests. All of us having access to God directly without going through some mediator, man, pastor, teacher, evangelist, someone with a mic. You, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the same access to God as anyone in this room, anyone in the world. There is no special access that someone gets because they maybe have a different gift. I do not have different access to God than you. Neither does someone who hails themselves a prophet or a king. We all have the same access to God, and that's really important for us to grasp. So, if we look at what confession means in the Bible. So, confession actually means more than just confessing sins. Okay, There are two words in the New Testament that I used, and I'm going to attempt to say these in Greek. Now, last time I attempted to say a big word on stage, if you were here, you knew I, it went wrong. I couldn't get my words out. But I am not going to let failure determine my future. Amen. I am going to have a drink of water, though. So the two words are, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah, should I make them up? Squibbly bobbly and bobbly boo. It's homologeo. There's one. And exomologeo. Not too bad. Thank you, thank you. I'm done. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so those words in the Greek mean to confess, to acknowledge, to agree, to admit, to declare. There is a profession of allegiance and the which is very similar, but is maybe a little bit more 
um, like you've stuck an exclamation mark on it. It's a little bit more emphatic. It also means publicly, okay? So it's really important when we look at the word confession and the confession of discipleship that we don't just simply make it all about the confession of sin. However, it is about the confession of sin. So what we're going to do this morning is I'm actually going to do a little bit of a two-part message. I'm going to have a halfway in between, just to let you know. Um, And we're going to look at first the confession of sin and the confession of sin to one another. And then we're going to have a little bit of time of response. Okay, we're going to have some time to respond to whatever it is the Holy Spirit's put on our heart, prompting us about. Um, And then we're going to look at our confession in our faith in Jesus. So I could get down now because I've told you everything I'm going to say. But as any good preacher, I'm going to say it again about 20 times in different ways, all saying the same thing. So we're going to look, the first point is confession of sin to God. Okay. So we're going to look at this from 1 John chapter 1. If you've got your Bible or your phone, wherever you read your Bible, if you want to turn to that, 1 John chapter 1. And we're going to read through verses 5 to 10. If you have neither, it will be on the screen. It says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, I can't say that without thinking about DC Talks. (laughs) Yeah. Song. Some of you in the room, that just went like... The band probably, I'd say the 90s, um, released a song about being in the light. Anyway, we, we digress. Um, we have, so he says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So 1 John is is a fantastic book. Um, I I recommend that you read it. But here we're looking at chapter 1, focusing mainly on verse 9, where it says this, if we confess, if we agree, acknowledge, speak out, our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, very quickly, from verses 6 to 10, there are, there are five verses that say if. So if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another. And then it says, if we claim to be without sin, if we confess our sin, if we claim to have not sinned. Okay, so. In the Greek, in the grammar, very quickly, just to emphasize this point on this verse 9, the first part of the verse does not make the second part of the verse true. Okay, so let me read it and and, and hopefully explain. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Okay, so the first part of the verse, if we confess our sins, does not make God faithful and just. God is faithful and just, so much so that this statement, he is faithful and just, is a timeless stamp in the middle of that verse. That is a fact. That is, that is written in the Greek as though it is just fact. He is faithful and just. And the rest of what we read is based around that. He is faithful and just. Therefore, if we confess our sins, he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's not simply doing that because we are acting. He is doing it because he is faithful and just. God is faithful and just. Now, in these verses, what I do want to say is that confession and repentance are not necessarily, well, they're not the same thing. They often are very closely linked. So repentance is a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of direction in your life. That's what that word means. So when we come to a point of salvation, okay, and we make, we we repent, we confess our sins, we repent, we turn our life around. Many of you in in this room will have, have, have experienced that moment of repentance of a transformed life, a change of direction where you acknowledge and admit that Jesus is Lord and Savior and his way is right and you choose to follow Jesus. That is a moment of salvation. This word confession 
is not, does not determine our salvation. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll explain that by saying, this is not about your sonship or daughtership. This does not mean you are a child or not, okay? So when it looks at confessing sin, what it's not doing is saying, you need to get saved again. That's not what this verse is saying. This verse is not saying, you need to confess your sins so that you can be saved again. Because you've already been saved, okay? This verse is not talking about that. This verse, however, is a continuous tense. This, is, this verse, the way it is written, is an ongoing force. It's something that is to be continuous. Not a one-time thing. Not something you only do at salvation. This is not like, oh, I've confessed my sins. I don't need to do it again. I've repented. That's not the emphasis of this verse. This, the emphasis of this verse is that it is an ongoing part of the Christian life. It is, it is an ongoing part of our discipleship. So, I hear your brain thinking, why do I need to confess my sins if I've already been forgiven? Because the Bible tells us that all our sins are forgiven. That Jesus doesn't need to die again. He doesn't need to go to the cross again because, oh, I just sinned today. Oh, I need this sin forgiven and it wasn't paid for at the cross. Well, that's terrible theology. I think we'd all admit that, wouldn't we? That Jesus' death on the cross paid for all sin. Final, done, job done. It is finished. So if I'm forgiven, why do I now need to confess? And it's a good question and a good thought. John Piper explains it like this. He talks about uh, salvation, uh, the work of Jesus at the cross, accomplished. So everything the work of Jesus accomplished at the cross. Okay? The, for the forgiveness of all sins. The redemption of, of his people, his children, his bride. All that was paid for at the cross. There's no need for that to be done and paid for again. However, what he talks about is the work of the cross applied. Okay? The application of that in our life. A good illustration uh, we could take from maybe marriage or uh, parenthood or just, you know, really close friendship is that I, I like to use the anal analogy of being a father. Okay, so I have two children, Amos and Zion. Now, Amos and Zion sometimes are a little bit cheeky. Yeah? Her ears pricked up there because she's, she's coloring. Sometimes they hurt each other. Sometimes they hurt me, <laughs> you know. Uh, yesterday, Amos punched me somewhere. <laughs> say no more. Now, I didn't say, oh, it's all right. It's okay. You're my son. doesn't matter that you did that. I should have used a better analogy. Um, I don't need to say, oh, it's all right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you're my son. And I'm going to forgive you for everything in life anyway. So you don't need to understand what you've done. You don't need to say sorry. That's irrelevant. I, I love you. You're my son. Amos is my son and will be my son for the rest of our days. That won't change. That's done. That's job done. However, if he does something and hurts someone, hurts me, yeah, we sit him down. We try to explain to him why his actions were wrong, why they weren't acceptable, and why he should say sorry, and what sorry means. Sorry is not lip service, which I assure you sometimes we get that. Say sorry to your sister. Sorry. No, no. You see, where this falls out of line of the understanding, there's no, there's no acknowledgement, there's no agreement that what he did was wrong. There's just a word. Confession is not lip service to sin. It's not. It, it really isn't. Confession is, is about our understanding and our admittance and our acknowledgement that what I have done is wrong. Therefore, the natural response to that usually is to say, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I hurt you. We've made it like, I, I don't know, I feel like this is one of the spiritual practices of, of the Christian walk that we've maybe shied away from a little bit because so often confession is, uh, and the admittance of sin is, is linked to guilt and shame and judgment and, you know, oh, if we, if we tell someone or if we confess our sin, we don't want to be judged. And, but that's not what this is about. This is about having, being in right standing with God. Sin does get in the way. Sin does get in the way. If you, have, if you are willfully, intentionally just doing your own thing and, and sinning away, making decisions that you know are out of line with the word of God and the truth of God, that will get in the, right, with the way of your relationship. It does not mean that you are not a child of God. 
but it is getting in the way of your relationship and it is meaning that you are not living a Christ-like life. So coming into alignment with what the Bible says about sin is us aligning ourselves with the truth of God so that we can live like Christ and glorify God and love one another as Christ loved us. This is not about judgment and condemnation. Please hear my heart and I believe the heart of scripture on this. We see that in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is addressing his disciples. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer for believers because we know that because it says our Father. And you can only say our Father if you're a child of God. Okay? If you want me to elaborate on that more later, grab me in the, the mill, we'll have a coffee. The Lord's Prayer is to believers, our Father. Not everyone can call me Father. Amos can because he's my child, my son. Zion can because she's my daughter. And likewise, if the Lord, uh, the God is your father, then you can say our father. And yet in the Lord's Prayer, we read this line, forgive us our sins. Aren't they all forgiven? Yeah, they are. Forgive us our sin sins as we forgive those who sin against us. This is a daily part of our life that we are constantly coming into alignment, not to magnify all the things we're doing wrong in our life, but to magnify the glory and goodness and wonder of Jesus and say, that's what I want to be. That's who I want to follow. That is what I want my life to look like. And these things that I'm doing fall out of line with that. When I'm rude, when I'm proud, when I'm impatient, when I'm, you know, sarcastic with someone who opens the door or drives in a narrow street. And <laughs> what I loved is Phil just opened the meeting with confession. He didn't even realize it. <laughs> Should pray a prayer of blessing on them as they, as they go by. Um, lost my train of thought. So, and, that, and let me just say, this, this confession of sin is between you and God, okay? It's between you and God. You don't need to go to anyone. This is going to sound like I'm contradicting myself <laughs> on the next point, because I've already told you it's confessed sins to one another. But there is a confession which is between you and God, anywhere, anytime. You don't need to be here on a Sunday. You really don't, anywhere, anytime. As soon as you realize you've done wrong, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, I'm, I want to be like Jesus. Thank you that I'm forgiven. <laughs> but I don't want to do that. Okay? The next one is confession of sin to one another. Okay, just a, actually just a quick point on the last one. Should we just... Uh, Rewind two minutes. So some reasons maybe people don't confess sin. Okay? Sometimes we don't know we're sinning. <laughs> we don't know we're sinning. We might be doing something that we don't realize is sinful. Um, but, you know, things like being in a community where we speak truth to one another, not judgment, but truth, where we read the word of God, where we listen to sermons, where we try to understand if certain behaviors are wrong. That's how we, you know, sometimes people don't realize that what they're doing is sinful or wrong. Um, a shortcoming in the life of a disciple. Um, sometimes we don't want to stop sinning. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've enjoyed my sin and I don't want to confess it. Because I know if I admit it and I acknowledge that it's wrong, then I have to stop. I don't want to stop. So I'm not admitting it. I'm not acknowledging it. I'm going to ignore it. Um, but that's, I, I think that's, that is an unhealthy place to be as a disciple. A dangerous place to be can become an, a lonely and isolating place to be as well. Um, Sometimes we don't confess our sin because we think we've got too many we've unconfessed. Some of us think we've built up such a debt of sin that I don't know where to begin. Okay? Well, this is the truth. None of us ever will confess all our sins. This is the beauty of the grace of God. There are so many things we do that fall short of his glory, so many of which we don't even realize and know, and we won't realize and know, and yet he covers us with grace. But sometimes we do know specific sins through reading the word of God or the Holy Spirit's prompting and nudging, or someone challenges us and we don't like it because how dare anyone tell me I was rude? <laughs> the irony. How dare you tell me I was full of pride and arrogant? Sometimes our realization that we have done wrong and fallen short as a disciple does come through our brothers and sisters in Christ. It does. Um, and let us have humble hearts to accept that but let us not be judgment in our 
uh, our delivery, a judgmental in our delivery. <clears throat> okay, so now moving on to confession of sin to one another. So if we look at James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, it says this. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Is anyone happy? I just told you you're all sinners. <laughs> you're all like, no, I'm not happy. You've just told me I'm a sinner. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make that sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess. This is the one. I'm not going to try and say it again. We publicly, openly confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. This is a verse I think we like to ignore because we don't like to confess our sins to one another um, for the most part because it's uncomfortable. I was watching a video this week, Dr. Darrell Ferguson. He uses this tremendous analogy. I've totally pinched it and I'm not even ashamed to say it. He, uh, he illustrates this point by saying that he got a cut on, on his hand. I actually cut myself shaving the other day, and it sort of works, although it's not healed yet. But when, it's, you know, when you cut yourself, so I cut myself shaving the other day, shaving my head. You might be thinking, why is he shaving on his forehead? It's because I shaved my hair. I don't have a very high beard line. Uh, shaving, and I, and I cut my head, uh, and I did nothing. I just left it. Um, and my body being, not my body being amazing, but the human body being amazing, started to heal itself so it's um, now I am not a biologist a doctor I have robbed this if I get this wrong just go with me humor me yeah <laughs> humor me on this you know the platelets rush to that area to clot the bleeding the white blood cells they rush to make sure there's no infection in that area and I'm going to say this because this is it. and these things called fibroblast cells yeah fibroblast cells, they work to repair the tissue. So unfortunately, I was really praying it'd be healed and it'd work brilliantly for my analogy, but I've still got a cut. But in a couple of days, it'll be healed, it'll be gone. And this is the analogy, that that's how the body of Christ should respond to one another when we're in trouble, whether that's with a struggle in our life, a sickness in our life, or a sin in our life. We should not, please hear me on this, we should not respond with judgment, with isolation, with condemnation, because that is not what Jesus did for you and me. When we confessed our sins to Jesus, he removed our sins from us. As far as the east is from the west, he drew us in, he embraced us. He said, my mercy there, my mercy's there new every day. My grace is sufficient in your weakness. So why should we as a body of believers for one minute think that if someone was vulnerable enough and humble enough to bring their sin into a confession of other brothers and sisters, that that should mean judgment, isolation, reprimand. I think we get this wrong in church. I do. I've got to be honest. I think we get this wrong. I get this wrong. I'm not pointing no fingers. I get this wrong. Oh, I flipping knew it. I flipping knew it. I knew they were sinning. <laughs> I've been dying to tell them for ages. Flipping. <laughs> yeah. And what Dr. Daryl Ferguson says, he says this part of the book of James, he says, that's really the analogy, the emphasis that here, you know, if you're sick, if you need prayer, we could look at Galatians and we could look at how we carry one another's burdens and we bring our burdens and our struggles to one another. But I think so often we're afraid of confessing our sins to people because we're afraid of what they might think of us. They're afraid that if we say, I've really been struggling with this, we might face judgment. We might face, you know, condemnation. They maybe think less of us. It may impact on our ministry. Leaders are some of the worst people for this, myself included. You don't want to tell people you're a sinner. What if it affects 
you know, well, you, people think you're a leader. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in the worship team. I can't be sinning. I'm, I'm standing on stage. I'm preaching on Sunday. I can't tell someone I'm, I've sinned. They might not listen to me. They might think I'm unworthy. Well, I am. <laughs> you know, as I was thinking of this, I, I have a realization in my own life that I've become so self-sufficient as a Christian. I really have. I've become so self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is a crippler and a killer for Christian life. Because self-sufficiency says, I can do this on my own. It very quickly becomes a moral walk of making sure we uphold a moral standard. We lose what is absolutely essential and necessary, and that's the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us in order to live like Jesus, which is the, f the first and foremost call for any Christian. Now, I know sometimes we talk about needing the Holy Spirit for great acts of faith and stepping out in faith, and that's not wrong, and I'm not belittling that, but what I am saying is to simply live like Jesus. To live like Jesus. To pursue a walk after Jesus, to live in his humility with his grace and his patience and his love for each and every one of us. I need the Holy Spirit. I cannot do that on my own, yet I have become self-sufficient. So I acknowledge that. I admit that. I know I'm wrong for that because that self-sufficiency has meant that I've not needed to lean in to my relationship with God. I've not, I've not realized at times when I've been rude or proud, impatient, bitter, because I've not been leaning into my relationship with God. I've been leaning into my own self-sufficiency. Now, a few points on confessing sins to others. Some practical points. I do think there is a wisdom in this. There is a wisdom in what is shared and to whom it is shared. Okay, so, uh, in fact, Sam, if you could come and join me. We're, we're gonna, just going to go into a time of response for the confession of sins and confession of sins to one another. I do think sometimes the confession of sin is that you've hurt someone and you need to go and say sorry. It might be someone in this room. It might be someone at work. It might be someone in your family. And what happens is we do a great job as human beings of convincing ourselves that it's not our fault and it's not on us to apologize and it's not on me to say sorry. But very often that's a lack of humility and it's very much the presence of pride. But my Bible says that God opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble. So I want to align myself with the word of God and be humble because God gives grace to the humble. So sometimes it is a confession to someone about an act of sin or wrongdoing or hurt that you have caused someone else. Sometimes it's, it's relevant if you're struggling with a, a behavior, a pattern of sin, a cycle of sin that you've been unable to shake or break. This is what you, you keep telling yourself. I do this, don't worry. This is what we keep telling ourselves. We'll be all right. We'll sort this on our own. I'll just keep saying sorry and I'll, I'll fix this on my own. But you see, and we don't tell people, but actually the body of believers is there to say, come on, let's, let's, let's beat this together. Let's, 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 you know, you're struggling with pride. You keep, you keep snapping at your kids. Basically, everything I'm saying is just things I do, yeah? <laughs> you're snapping at your kids. You, 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 you shout with your wife when she challenges you. It's confession time. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I just want to be real this morning. I just want to acknowledge that we, are, we all fall short. Some of us more frequently than others, and some of us maybe more dramatic in how we perceive things. But as a body of Christ, we should be able to come around our brothers and sisters and say, I'm really struggling with this. I'm really struggling with this, 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 this habit, this addiction, this behavior, whatever it might be. And it's not there for judgment and condemnation. We are not 
you know, keeping notes and tracks. This is not going to the pastoral team unless you choose to allow it to. This is not something we're going to tick on a spreadsheet. Say, oh, on a spreadsheet. On a, and say, oh, somebody's confessed their sins. That's brilliant. This is either between you and God and you and God alone or you and a close, wise counsel of friends that you trust. Okay? A month or two ago, there was a great outpouring of God's power in a place called Asbury in America. It was deemed as a revival or an awakening. A service that started lasted longer than two weeks. It was supposed to last 30 minutes. You know, 100 people or so, if that, in a room. Met for a regular daily chapel. And the meeting didn't end. It just kept going. It just kept going. 50, 60,000 people descended on a town because they got wind that, that God was moving in this part of America. It's said that what happened is someone got up and confessed their sin. Worship was going on and someone got up and openly, publicly confessed. I don't know what they confessed. Just fallen away from God. Something changed. David Gruzik, who is a, a scholar, but also someone who's studied much about revivals throughout history, said this. There is this aspect of great conviction of sin and subsequent confession of sin that is common during times of spiritual awakening or revival. William Newton Blair, who was an American that moved to Korea and in 1907 experienced an incredible great outpouring of the work of God, a revival that is known in history, says this. We may have our theories on the desirability or undesirability of our public confession of sin. I have had mine. But I know that when the Spirit of God falls upon guilty souls, there will be confession. And no power on earth can stop it. In the book of Acts chapter 19, we see a spiritual awakening or revival in the church of Ephesus. It says this in, in verse 18. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. Confession isn't a dirty word. It's a liberating thing that we do in our lives. For some of you, you've maybe never confessed your sin. Maybe this morning you choose to confess your sin and acknowledge that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. For some of you, you made the decision to follow Jesus Christ you are absolutely saved and redeemed and are being restored and working out your salvation. But there are some things in your life that are just getting in, that, in, in the way of your relationship with God. And you know it, I don't need to know it. And the Holy Spirit knows it. And the Holy Spirit is prompting you, nudging you, reminding you. There is no judgment. Because Jesus is saying, come to me. Come to me. Come and bring it to the foot of the cross. And leave it there. I've asked Sam to just lead us in a time of reflection and worship. The song is called Come to the Altar. And there's no prescription here for how you do this. You can come to the front if you want. We can have an old-fashioned altar. You come to the front and respond, kneel, you can stay in your seat, you can get up, you can go and stand with someone, you can go and talk to someone, you can go and ask for prayer, there's no rules, you just can't go to the mill for an early coffee, that's the only thing you can't do, because they're not finished yet, but I just want to invite the Holy Spirit right now, Holy Spirit, that you would just come and move amongst us, with grace and mercy, as is your nature. Holy Spirit, would you help us remove the barriers that stand in the way? Holy Spirit, would you just soften hearts? 
humble our hearts in this place this morning. In Jesus' name.